Welcome to another episode of Jukebox Zeros. I'm Lee. Howdy boy, I'm Patrick. And we haven't really settled on how we're going to open each show. We're how many episodes in and we still, we're still saying a different thing every time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that just gives it a little more variety, a little more off-the-cuffness. That's, that's true. That's what the kids like. Variety days. is the spice of life. Yeah, we're, you know, we're retro script in this thing. I mean, barely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is that called story editing? Who said that? Yeah. We, we, have, we haven't introduced <laughs> you yet. Get back in your corner. All right. Well, <laughs> we, we won't waste that, too much time. That's the time. sound of going back to your corner. All right. We won't waste too much time right. since our guest is uh, he's, he's ready to rock and roll. Oh, oh yeah. Before, but, we, uh, before we do get into uh, Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> before we do get onto it, we got to get uh, to the segment that everyone loves the most, uh, the apologies <laughs> section. Oh, Just yeah. One second. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's the apology that, song. That was great. I'm, I'm so glad you didn't even tell me <laughs> that you made that. <laughs> that's my first apology. I apologize for not telling Patrick that I put that together. Uh, no, the, the surprise, I think, was <laughs> made, made it for me, really. Uh, you got Spontaneity. Any, you got anything to apologize for this week, uh, Patrick? Me? No, anything we did I, in the last episode or anything like that? I, I refuse to apologize for the amount of time so that I say sorry <laughs> on a given and on a given basis. So oh, fuck I'm, that. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have that as a tattoo, actually. One thing I will apologize for, which it took me this long to realize this, um I say like a lot during the recordings. Like, endlessly, I just keep going, uh, like, 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 just, it's like a comma for me. I mean, do I apologize for it? Yes. Will I make any attempt to not say it so much? Probably not. Uh, yeah, that's just gonna happen. Just It's a verbal tick. Just deal with it. Yeah, yeah it's a just, tick. Just fucking deal with it. Yeah, if you Guys, have a problem with it. we don't ask much of you except to deal with it. If you could just do that for us, that would be... That would be just cool beans. Yeah, and Logic Pro, if you can get on the uh, the anti like the 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 D liker <laughs> VST, that right. would be much appreciated. I mean, it took us this long to find out that the uh, that the filter that gets rid of the nasal uh, cavity that, that that's not a thing. Oh, the yeah the the de the demucasizer. De de yes, which was a terrible name that I came up get with. On, right get on that. that. Too, get on that too, Logic. Yes. Yeah, Come on. Right, I, I got to, something to say from the corner here. Um, oh, okay. We right. might as well. I, I got to say, <laughs> I got to say, with that whole like thing, I have to interject. Um, there is a pretty fun game that you can play with that word like. However, you need unsuspecting others to to participate. <laughs> How many people? Usually, you, you only need two. All right. Because you could be in a restaurant, on the train, anywhere, as long as it's people you don't know. Hmm. And uh, you're you're kind of eavesdropping. I mean, you're not paying attention. You're just paying attention for the word like used out of, gram out of like grammarly incorrect. When it's used as like an interjection like that. In, like in you just words. did. Yeah, you yes. see, that was... One incorrect way and one correct way. Well, now, now I'm just going to be self-conscious about it the whole recording session. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, can, I can shut it off. I can shut mm. it off. But right. only a couple of times have I actually gotten up the cojones to go up to the unsuspecting <laughs> people and said, you know what? You just used the word like 47 times in the last 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I actually, where it was not grammatically correct to say so. I actually found out about this tick because my girlfriend and I were listening to one of the episodes back, and she actually she basically threatened to keep a tally from that episode forward. See, she knows the game. I have to imagine at this point it would be in the early two hundreds by now. <laughs> All right. Well, now, hey that, Patrick, why yeah. don't we introduce our mystery guest from the corner? Yes. Now that our guest has spoken out of turn several times, uh, <laughs> this is. <laughs> 
<laughs> you, you made high, this yes. is highly unusual, highly unorthodox. Really? Yes. Oh, I'm mm. surprised more people didn't do it. <laughs> this is like the fourth time now. <laughs> uh, you may know him from a uh, the uh, WMFO program, uh, the, the, the Weasel the Show, with, and the On the Town with Mikey. And D. on the town with Mikey D, he he DJs and uh, plays some local music. Sometimes some he, of my crap. He helps the people get down to the rock and roll music. He does, and he also uh, lead sings or, or sings lead for the group Ease Into the Noise, uh, for which I am also a part of. Uh, his name is Phil Fleming. Hello. Hi, Phil Fleming. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've said everything that you needed to say before I introduced well, you. Well, regard, <laughs> regarding the like game. Yeah. yeah. Regar- sorry. Regarding <laughs> like the like game. That's, like. that's better. <laughs> That works. I don't know. It's it's a fun game, especially if you're, you know, just like a vindictive kind of person. You know, you're just going to, you know, 21-year-olds and saying, you know, you've said the word like grammatically incorrect 47 times. Yeah. I'm hoping, like, a lot of our fan base And you go to be you. Yeah. (laughs) We we do have a very pedantic following, so I think this would be... (laughs) There we go. This would be right up there. Right. (laughs) I mean, as, Us lo- included. as long as we're talking about weird, slightly annoying grammar things, um, I've always had a problem with this recent trend of people just saying I'm lying when they just don't want to admit that they're wrong. Like, what? it'll be like maybe you've uh, like maybe you've run into this sort of thing. Someone will say like uh, if like you just ask them a question, they'll just give an answer, but then they'll stop themselves just be oh no wait I lied. It's no, it's okay to admit that you were wrong. Don't don't say you lied. I, I'm not that. familiar with this idiom. Oh, really? I yeah. I am. However, I'm not sure if that's entirely incorrect. I mean, because it's not it's not like you're doing um, just outright lying and then say, "Oh, wait, I'm lying." Well, I know it's not you know meant with any sort of malice or anything like that. It's mm. just, I mean, if you look at it, that's don't don't say you lied. Don't don't lie, guys. Don't be a liar. Okay. Patrick, tell tell the tell the people don't be a liar, Patrick. Don't be a liar, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all right. Well, let's talk about uh, let's yeah. uh let's get and dive in. Yeah, let's let's, let's save the gr- let's save the grammatical quibbles for the spin-off podcast. Grammatical quibbles with <laughs> Leo Patrick, with Phil Fleming. With Phil Fleming and fr- with Phil and friends. Grammar <laughs> heroes. <laughs> there we go. Grammar <laughs> heroes. <laughs> Oh, down to the grammar rodeo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> grammar rodeo. Ooh, oh man, that's a that's a good podcast name. If not, if that not a really a good... bad country band name, <laughs> grammar rodeo, <laughs> like an educational country band. Yeah, something like that. Like, that would never ever happen. No, nothing. It's like anti-education. Like an even less entertaining writers in the sky. <laughs> Oh boy! Yeah. Oof. Anyway, okay. let's uh, uh, let's dive into writers in the today's sky. We're episode. sorry, writers in the sky. If you if you want to make it up to us, come on the podcast. There we go. They can help us review Love Beach. Thank you. Right. <laughs> anyway, enough fucking around. Yeah, let's, let's talk get to about the music. Some music. Let's talk about this artist. Few could achieve as stately a musical career as Myra Ellen Amos has, better known by her stage name, Tori Amos. A renowned and acclaimed musician praised as much for her imaginative songwriting as the brutal honesty in her lyrics. Amos first broke out in the early 90s with the release of critical and commercially successful albums like 1992's Little Earthquakes, 1994's Under the Pink, uh, 1998's From the Choir Girl Hotel, and numerous others. Her discography would frequently jump around in sound ranging from alternative rock to chamber pop, uh, to Baroque to neoclassical, and even elements of electronica. But all of them were bolstered by Amos's own classically trained piano playing and mezzo-soprano vocal range. She, along with peers like Fiona Apple, they represented an innovative wave of contemporary female singer-songwriters in the 90s, renowned for singing songs that touched upon topics not so widely covered by her peers, including stark themes of feminism, sexual identity, abuse, religious upbringing, and psychological torment, among many others. Her career would bring her numerous nominations for Grammys, MTV VMA Awards, Brit Awards, and innumerable Billboard chart singles. 
VH1 listed her as one of the 100 greatest women of rock and roll, and in 2012, she was inducted into the North Carolina Hall of Fame. Though her big breakthrough came during the 90s, Amos's music career began, albeit in a very rocky way, in 1986, when she formed a musical group called Why Can't Tori Read, named after her difficulty with sight reading, which is kind of a jerk move, unless she, unless she came up with it. I, I think her bandmates came up with it. Oh. I think they were That's well, they, well, well, being classically trained, it probably came from that. It does beg the question, why, yeah. why can't Tori read if she was classic? All right, I'm sorry. Yeah, continue. <laughs> anyway, in contrast to the piano-centric style of music that Amos would be celebrated for, Why Can't Tori Reed sound was unmistakably synth-pop and featured contributions from future Amos collaborator Steve Canton on guitar, Brad Cobb of 80s Christian glam metal group Striper on bass, <laughs> And uh, this should be the big kicker, Matt Sorum of Guns N' Roses, The Cult, and Velvet Revolver on drums. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Remember Velvet Revolver? Oh, yeah. Swamp. Anyway, Why Can't Tori Reid would release a self-titled debut album in 1998. Not, not 19, God, 1988. Cut that out. Don't, don't actually cut it out. Produced... Produced by Joe Ciccarelli, famed for producing and engineering for the likes of uh, Frank Zappa, The White Stripes, Counting Crows, and Atlantis Morissette, just to name a few. Why Can't Tori Read The Album was released to dismal reception, both commercially and critically. Rolling Stone magazine has referred to the album as a cautionary tale, and listed it in their article, 20 Terrible Debut Albums by Great Artists. Not long after the band's release, Amos herself would distance herself from it, citing label interference from Atlantic Records. As a band, Why Can't Tori Reid didn't last long enough to record a follow-up. All critical and commercial opinion of the time seems to indicate that uh, Why Can't Tori Reid was an abysmal failure of an album. But was it, though? That's what we're going to find out today. On Jukebox Zero. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh that was the stinger all right yeah um yeah so uh, i guess this is where i probably say some things yeah right? do you guys have any like opening thoughts before we get into the tracks uh phil why don't, why don't you give your well, relationship to the album my my relationship to the album to be honest i did not hear it until it was surprisingly reissued for black friday record store day yeah last that was, that was just November. last year uh, yeah. Last November, it That's was right. remastered and re-released last November, and I only found out that it was coming out probably about a week, maybe two weeks before, mm. and it, apparently there's been enough distance from it that Tori started performing some of the songs live Yeah, again, well... Did they, I, I'm wondering if the old, if, I'm wondering if the Why Can't Tori Reed band ever toured. Um, don't know. I don't think so. Just out of curiosity, when we were like uh, in the fall, in the lead up to the recording this episode, I tried looking up live performances of Why Can't Tori Reed. Yeah, all I could nothing. find, all I could find was just footage of Tori Amos performing Why Can't Tori Reed songs. Yeah. Uh, in her own style. In the in the last like five or six years. I actually had something that I wanted to say about that sort of thing uh, before we did get into the tracks. Okay. Just from the backstory alone, I can see all kinds of parallels to another album that we've reviewed on the podcast, With Sympathy by Ministry, which was another early album featuring a wildly different sound than what the artist would become famous for, only to be renounced by the creator. Al Jorgensen even cites the same label interference excuse on the contrasting sounds. There's a big difference between the two, though, that... One thing I want to point out is that even though they both initially denounced the albums and blamed their labels, decades later, the attitudes are just completely different. I mean, like you mentioned, Tori Amos has kind of made peace with the album, and she's been performing select tracks and concerts. It's been reissued on vinyl. Um, Uncle Al is still ripping on With Sympathy yeah. to this very day, and he generally just treats it like an unperson. I mean, I'll just say, I guess some people intellectually mature with more grace and aplomb than others— <laughs> some people some people grow, some people evolve, some people come to terms with past embarrassments, and others release albums with titles like From Beer to Eternity. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. I, I, I'm the, just kidding, Uncle Al. We love you. We do. Come on the show sometime. Yeah. Review Love Beach with us. There Someday. you go. 
Someday we will get Alan Jorgensen on here to review Love and Peace. <laughs> I'm sure he'd love it. Yeah. So uh, I hadn't heard anything by Tori Amos before doing this episode. Right. Me and neither. That's, and that surprises me considering how pretty ubiquitous she was leading up to the 21st century. Yeah. But I've, I like I couldn't really tell you any of her singles. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, by name. I, I very recently found out that a song of hers was actually by her and like not by Fiona Apple like I originally <laughs> okay. thought. That's kind was, of the same process I was going through too. <laughs> which was it was Cornflake Girl, which which now that I'm like a little more familiar with Tori Amos, I'm like, duh, this sounds like a fucking Tori Amos yeah. song. So anyway, yeah, I've just well, like the, the, a similar I, Oh I, sorry. You no know, I guess I can see your point, but as someone who well, admittedly, probably a few years older than you, yes. and watched 120 minutes religiously. I knew about Tori Amos when Silent All These Years came out, mm. and I was like, "Yeah, it's it's a cute piano ballad, and I don't like cute piano ballads." <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, Crucify was a little bit better, yeah. But uh, I mean, and, but she kind of hooked me in with Cornflake Girl, right? And God. God, yeah, God's a great track. God's, so God and Cornflake Girl were like the big singles, at least in this country, the right. United States, Definitely. by the way. <laughs> of, uh, in case you didn't know. And for, for all your international listeners. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm acknowledging them. Case thank you. A, thank you for doing that, In case Phil. there was any confusion, this podcast is recorded in America. <laughs> America. America. Not Easter Island or anything crazy nope. like that. Not Trinidad or Tobago. Nope. Neither. Neither not, one of those. Not that we would have any problem with going there, but no, no, it just no, no, isn't no. the case. Some, yeah. Some, one thing that I will admit that I feel a little bit silly for not realizing at this point. I mean, I realized this many years ago, but for the longest time, it's like the complete opposite of what you said. Um, I thought the Fiona Apple song Criminal was by Tori Amos. <laughs> that is funny. I mean, and then I found out and I was like, oh. Well, like, like what you, you said, they sort of like. They were, you know, yeah, they were very the similar clock. aesthetic. They yeah. were in the same wheelhouse. Yeah. Well, the, well, I'm pretty sure Tori Amos wishes he, she wrote Criminal by Fiona <laughs> Apple. <laughs> I don't know. It, I mean, well, that was like a significant, like, big hit for yeah. Fiona Apple. Well, she yeah, like won sure. a Grammy and the whole thing. Yeah. Got featured on Family Guy as a <laughs> oh, fucking yeah. cutaway. That's how you know you hit the big time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so anyway. Like, on South Park. Yes. So what I, what I was getting at was like I didn't really know much about the, <laughs> I didn't know much about this artist going into it and like it was really really cool going into like Little Earthquakes and and like her more celebrated albums right. being like oh cool like I just discovered a new artist that I like really like mm. and then going back and checking out this album that it just I can kind of tell it's them but it's just so bizarre yeah. that I you can, you it's can like a hear, train wreck in, in some ways. Yeah. That sounds like uh, a pretty good segue to actually get into the songs. Mm. Uh, what do you say we dive in? Oh, yeah. Let's dive in. All right. Let's... Uh, trains do dive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, trains have been famous for diving. So let's get into... <laughs> <laughs> famous trains. Famous, t- famous diving famous trains. trains. Uh, let's see. Famous trains. Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> Um, uh, the love train by uh-huh. the Temptations. I want to say, yeah, yes. There's the band uh, Train, cr- Crazy Train by Ozzy Osbourne, mm-hmm. Peace Train by uh, Cat Stevens, mm-hmm. uh, um, Take the A Train by uh, <laughs> the Party Train by know. Gap Band. Oh, there um, we go. There we go. I like that song too. <laughs> I I guess that's it. I mean, we have named every single famous train. Here we go. Every single one. You, you mentioned Thomas, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we're getting. The, oh, oh yeah, he's, we're, a, we're, he's a number one. <laughs> he's the number one train. You better he's have mentioned most, Thomas. He's the most famous train. He he would write some fucking angry hate mail next week God. if we forgot to mention him. Oh. Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, those <laughs> those uh, shining time station fans are tenacious. Mm. I was talking about Thomas the the tank engine himself would send it. You guys, you mentioned me. <laughs> you fucking joke. He has to be angry to write a letter without hands. <laughs> right, seriously. All right. Oh anyway, enough. Uh, okay. 
Enough, uh, enough stalling. Let's get into the album. Enough uh, Thomas Foolery. <laughs> <laughs> the first track from "Why Can't Tori Read" by uh, famous piano, by famous piano chamber pop singer Tori Amos. This is the first track, "The Big Picture." Don't my keys. I told her it's my life. <laughs> right oh, off yeah. the bat. Oh, absolutely. I from, fucking loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from the stories I had heard about this album leading up to it, this this album has that kind of reputation of just being terrible just from from like, you know, mainstream critics. So I was expecting something a little more embarrassing in the level of like, you know, something really teeny boppery, but you know what? It's a lot less Cindy Lauper and more of this. Yeah, I it kind of reminded me of a dumbed down uh, "Big Sky" by Kate Bush off of Hounds of Love. Oh yeah, there's hmm. there's so much Kate Bush sounding sort of stuff oh, on here. Yeah, oh yeah, I think that was like, probably for the springboard couples. for getting signed to Atlantic. Yeah, yeah, like they needed a Kate Bush. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and the problem was the Hounds of Love album came out in like what eighty five. Yeah, right. yeah, and and this band you know didn't come out with this until eighty eight. I yeah. think that was a huge part of why this album that, that's, tanked. That they were ready like, to go on to the next thing. That seems like it was also enough time for people to have uh, taken in, like, you know, the whole of Kate Bush's sound, yeah. but also enough time for people to, like, experience it without getting any of the subtleties of it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. now, well, you see, that that was the big picture was the first single, and there was yeah. actually a music video produced. There was. I'm so mad I, I haven't gotten a chance to watch it yet, but I read the description, and I, I definitely... Oh, it's it's very, very, very 80s. Yeah. <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> yes. I would have never thought. Co- complete, complete with small acting intro. And, <laughs> oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah, right. watching Tori Amos recite lines. Yeah. <laughs> it's her equivalent of Run DMC banging on the wall, telling Aerosmith to turn it down. Oh, man. Or, or uh, those openings of those early Poison videos where there's a little bit of dialogue <laughs> and then the song comes on. Oh, that boy. That shit was so stupid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this was one of the few songs that had a Wikipedia article on it, and mm. there's one line from it that I thought was particularly choice. Um, the line goes, the song was a commercial failure and received absolutely no critical comment. <laughs> I saw that. That's, that's absolutely bit, no critical comment. That's a bit harsh, don't you think? Yeah. Uh-huh. The comment on it was that there was no critical comment. That's pretty fantastic. I didn't think Wikipedia would be so catty. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> wow. Very sassy. Mm. So I don't think it's a terrible song, but it's, I mean, com- it's weird to hear this song and then hear... Amos currently, especially considering a lot of the... If you listen to the lyrics, it's weirdly materialistic Mm. and corporate. I mean, maybe that was meant to be satire, but there are lines about, like, I gotta get more money and someone broke into my car. Um, Well, well, you're you're just talking about that particular song. I mean, the entire... Well, yeah, yeah, I'm just talking about the song. Yeah. No, well, the the entire album was done before a lot of life-changing events happened to her. Which That's inspired true, Little Earthquakes, mm. right? So, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know. No, like having been, having paid attention to Tori Amos's career since she broke out in '92, it, it. I mean, maybe I have a slightly different take of what of which it'll, you know reveal itself over the course of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's worth mentioning that uh Phil specifically picked this album for us to for us to I, do. I I did suggest it and it yeah, I said why can't Tori read and he said, "Oh yeah, we were planning on that." And okay. <laughs> yeah, why can't Tori read? Why can't Tori read? Guys, she's why? got she's got eye problems, remember? <laughs> <laughs> she just can't read music. <laughs> Don't be, don't be jerks. Every time she looks at a piece of sheet music, they just turn into a bunch of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I guess, terrifying. I guess I... <laughs> Some kid in band practice. 
a first day of band practice. I don't, know what, you, clarinet. I don't ah. know. I don't know what you guys are looking at. This is a bunch of bugs on a piece of paper. <laughs> I gotta say, as someone who could barely read sheet music, I feel that very same me, way. Me oh, too. Yeah. Are, are we, am I supposed to look around the bugs, guys? Or <laughs> yeah, exactly. The scale, to... Are the scales hiding behind the bugs? How how am I supposed to play these bugs? <laughs> am I supposed to push them out of the way, or do I gotta give them to my cat? Wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> oh man. So I don't know if you guys caught the same thing from it, but a part of it kind of reminded me, like, especially during that big soaring, you know, the big picture chorus, I kind of got some glimpses of, like, 90s Madonna in that a little bit. A little you bit. know, when, when she was working with William Orbit and Mirawai, like, you know, uh, you know, Speed of Light and uh, Frozen mm. and that kind of stuff. Maybe that was just oh, me. Oh, that, that 90s That era Madonna. of Madonna. Yeah. We well, see at also as a lifelong fan of Madonna, I can I did not draw the comparisons, but I do see it now. Yeah, nineties chill house Madonna. <laughs> and chill yeah, that pretty much accurately. Yeah. Uh, ray of light, right? Yeah, yeah ray, ray of light. That's what I meant. Ray of light, not speed of light. So is, it, is that is that like a like at least a mild recommend? Should should I listen that to it? That is a very strong recommend. It's a strong recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Very mild recommend from me. Like I, I feel like I didn't like it as much as you guys did. I still, it was still an all right song. I didn't dislike it, but eh, it was just, it was just too weird to hear it and then listen to, you know, regular Tori Amos. It was very, it was very uncanny valley for me. I've got a like, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge Madonna fan, but I, I do have like a slight soft spot for that uh, beautiful stranger song that she did on the. Like, yeah, that's, that's that actually came out not- right after Ray of Light. Yeah, it was yeah. just like. It was like kind of yeah. It's not a bad song. I I personally well produced, well I personally written. really like that song Ray of Light too. Yeah, uh, it's it's well well produced, well well written. Good right. shit. Well, the, well the, that that's why I highly recommend that album because mm. before then she basically was writing very glossy surface stuff. She ha- yeah. actually had some so a few things to say after having a child. Right. <laughs> so that'll do it. And then she released American Life, and everything got really embarrassing. <sighs> that might have to be something we cover. Is that the one, episode. the video where, where, where her like butt cheeks are uh, in it or something? <laughs> um, <laughs> Is that how you remember it? <laughs> I was like fourteen when the when the video came out. Okay, cut me some slack. All right, I'm a little more. I, I can give a more mature. There you go. Assessment. Oof. Now I, I should. No, I'm but sorry. It, I mean, as as far as the vocal performance is concerned, I can see your your correlation to Madonna. It's circa nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, and and one thing I will say about the vocals, like even though some of these, like this is just a preview, some of these, some of the tracks on here can get a little bit cringy to me at least. Mm-hmm. But throughout the whole thing, Tori's Tori Amos's vocals just spot on. Absolutely, she's got she's got the pipes for it. Well, she they, is well, talented. That was one of the things that I noticed. In listening to the album as a whole, because, I mean, leading up to the re-release, there were only, I mean, there was the big picture video right. on YouTube, and uh, maybe a couple of there was an unof- album track rips. There was an unofficial video for the next track that we're going to cover. Okay. I yeah. don't, I'm not aware of that, but... Uh, I, I don't think it was released as a promotional video or anything like that. Hmm. I'm not sure what the story behind that but, is. Uh, but th- in listening to the album, I noticed that at least... Vocally, Tori had what she was going for. Yeah, which was like sort of like it was instantly identifiable. Definitely, I thought that was that. That's a good kind of connecting, um, connecting thread. Yeah, I noticed that it it, it sounded like very close to like what you know her her delivery would be on you know going little earthquakes forward with just like the slightest bit of eighties rasp. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> that '80s polish and pristine attached to it. Yeah, yes. that's just a little bit of harmonic, you know, exciter to make your voice sound like a fucking head <laughs> of high frequencies. Right. <laughs> anyway, let's move anyway. on to track two. Yeah, yeah, let's move on from there. We're on to track two now. This one is called. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned had a video made for it, but was never never really took like off. Someone made a video for it. This this was this is a song that I feel like could have been a single, but I guess it just wasn't. It it really seems like the record label lost faith after <laughs> the, the little big, single that could. <laughs> after after the big picture, as Wikipedia says, was a was a commercial failure and received no critical comment whatsoever. 
Anyway, this and may is, God uh, have mercy on your soul. <laughs> I award you no points. This is uh, track number two, titled Cool on Your Island. Yeah, we got another tropical got marimba, track. It's got marimbas, it's got slinky bass lines. Kind of kind of like a culture club track or UB40 a little bit. Yeah. Like so kinda, this was this I, I thought this track was actually kind of was kind of cool uh right up until those fucking island vocals come in. Oof. <laughs> I should I should mention all of the tracks on this album were written by Tori Amos except for a select few which were co-written by uh Kim Bullard of Kajagoogoo. Oh, Unf- yeah. Interesting. I didn't know there was a Kaja Goo Goo. That oh, makes yeah. a lot of sense. <laughs> Unfortunately, none of these tracks were co-written by Jim Beans. No, but I do. We I, are saddened to say. There is yeah. no bean stink on this one. No, no, <laughs> no bean beans, curd. Bean stank. <laughs> I definitely hear that Kaja Goo Goo stank all over this, though. I, I'm definitely feeling Yeah, especially with that synth bass. Right. Oh, yeah. The, the just like little little funk. But little I, funk with your I synth could, pop. I, I could have... I could have heard this as a single, you know, right after hearing, you know, like Paula Abdul or something on the radio. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think the 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 island breakdown is a little too tacked on. It's like definitely a, a little silly and almost like sticks cheesy? out way too much. Hey, oh yeah, it's definitely cheesy and like I know in the eighties the the fromage there were, lo- there were was lots of tropical forgiven. pop songs. Yeah, but this is like. Well, I mean, it, from the, like a redhead girl, right. <laughs> you know, well, like I mean, it seems a little. Well, I mean, Madonna had La, La Isla La, Bonita. Yeah, so. that's it. that would be the yeah, comparison true. I would have made. I mean, because if I recall, there's a little, there's tiny bits of Spanish guitar in this song yeah. too. Yeah, it kind of so, reminds yeah. me a little bit of uh, "Do You Really Want to Hurt Me" by Culture Club more than anything, mm. or like "Red Red Wine" by UB40. Now you see, I I don't get a reggae vibe at all. No, no. Mm. I mean it. it like I, I said, it's like more, it's like, more sort of like the mood more than anything is, yeah. I guess, what I'm getting from it. I mean, the, definitely the La Isla Bonita thing with like the little Spanish guitar licks and and the kind of breezy pace of the song. And this is this is going off this is going off topic. But speaking of La Isla Bonita, um, <laughs> uh, we're back to Madonna. Sh- Jesus. If you ever get the chance, look up. Uh, there's a live video of Madonna performing La Isla Bonita with Gogo Bordello. Whoa. It's actually really, really, really good. And like, I like it even more than the original. Because they like do that from? and then they interpolate uh, segments of uh, like a traditional uh, Slavic song called Lela Palatute into it. And it's pretty nuts. That that does sound. I think horrible. it was like I think it was I during gotta, one of the. I, we got to find that. Yeah, it was yeah. during one of those uh, more recent like uh, live two thousand eight performances. I think it was happening. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, back to the song. It right. sounds like you guys didn't really care for it so much. Uh yeah, this I wasn't so so much into this after the the fucking island like like starburst shit starts coming <laughs> in. <laughs> starburst shit. Okay. <laughs> it just sounds yeah. like very very like. Like corporate island, like like it's a setting on a Casio mm. keyboard. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked the fretless bass solo at at the end. Right, I said yeah. that that was that was cool. that was cool. Yeah, there's some there's some good bass shit all over this album, and I, I forget the name of the the other uh, person who plays bass is. Mm. But we have a uh, we have a s- actual CD. Yes, and if this was a web sh- like a like a like a like visual a web show, show yeah. visual webcam, whatever <laughs> webcam podcast, what. <laughs> Like vlog, <laughs> vlogcast, vlogcast, <laughs> vlogcast. <laughs> Welcome to vlogcast. Uh, uh, Tim <laughs> Landers is credited with bass. Uh, Tim Landers, yeah. Huh, that's strange. On the uh, like, when I was looking up the band, it uh, credited Brad Cobb of Striper as a bass player, but maybe that was just a very temporary thing. No, maybe he's not. He's not credited on on with Discogs. At least, on Discogs, a lot of people were. It, there are a lot of credits on this album, which I'll yeah. get to a little later. 
Yeah. There are a lot of things. There were a lot of credits. There are a lot of things credited to that guy from uh, Striper. I, I think he's, I think he's like just fucking hacking in, <laughs> just hacking into pages and like re-editing it, and saying, that he, <laughs> saying that he had credits out there. Oh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it should stand to reason then that maybe he would have erased that bit where it said there was no critical comment about the song. Oh, I there mean... was no critical comment except everybody loved the bass line from Brad Cobb of Striper. Oh. Submit. <laughs> yeah. That's no, nice. the, no. The bass is Tim Landers on everything except three songs, which is Fernando Saunders. Huh. Oh. So, I mean, like I said, it seems like you guys don't really like it. Um, I may blow your minds a little bit. I actually really like this song. Okay. I wouldn't call it my favorite, but... And I recognize all those points that you guys made, that it's very artificial. It's very, like, poppy to the point of being too corporate. But I just can't bring myself to dislike it. Something about it is just so pleasant. Something about the chord structure, the melodies, the arrangements. It's soothing a little bit. I will I will definitely attest to that, and I will... In general, uh, Tori Amos is like a fucking fantastic songwriter. Yeah, this is what I've learned over the past. And she's like, week an or incredibly so. charming vocalist too. Absolutely, very charming. Yeah, kind of I mean, saves the song a little bit. I mean, yeah, th- th- this saves the album, but I'll <laughs> save my thoughts for later. No, yeah. th- th- that this particular that particular song is just not was never in my wheelhouse because it's kind of you know mid tempo and breezy. Yeah, <laughs> not not my thing. Doesn't rock. Yeah, I was I was definitely more into up to even in my synth pop, I needed it up tempo. <laughs> right. So, yeah. of all of the tracks that of all the tracks on Why Can't Tori Read that Amos still performs live, uh, this is one of the most frequent ones, and I can see why this would be a favorite among her fans, like her most diehard fan base. Mm. Anyway, uh, you guys want to move on to track number three? Yes. Yeah. All right. This one is titled Faith, but with a Y. That that's not the whole title. It's F A Y T H. It's not yes. called it's not called Faith with a Y. <laughs> here, here, here's a track. You took my money, you took my sex, took my love, took my money. Give me faith. Help me keep myself to So, we've, we've come across the first clunker. Yeah, so that clunker is is uh, that is the word. I my note was here's a song where Tori Amos raps. Yes, yes. That, that's my note too. Um, <laughs> what I else have, can you? Say? I have it listed as an oppressively '80s track featuring Tori going all in on the sexy pop starlet aesthetic. Uh, complete with a misspelled title and Debbie Harry style rapping every so often. Oh man, yeah, this is like rapture, but like. So 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 off the mark. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I like the choruses. I, I was gonna say that the choruses are kind of like early talk talk. So I, yeah, I kind of right. dug that. Yeah, the choruses are like early talk talk, but the the verses just mm. it it probably shouldn't have been spoken because because the words themselves were ugh, were you know okay for verses you know yeah. forgettable verses but spoken word is yeah. is a is a big risk that's that's a that's a fucking spice yeah <laughs> that you need to like you need to like know the right time to use it i mean it, she she kind of did a little bit better with interpolating rap on her covers record called strange little girls yeah she covered uh bonnie and clyde by eminem yeah on 97 it. bonnie and clyde and it, she wasn't rapping in as much as it as turned it into kind of a spoken word thing on mm. that particular song. Well, that, that seems I think more she like did a, a real... couple of rap tracks that she turned into, you know, mel- melodic tracks. But right, that's more of a reinterpretation than just straight up rapping, though. Right. Yeah. Straight um, up rapping. <laughs> that, 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 this is Lee's first first rap album. Is straight up rapping. <laughs> straight up rapping. I too am gangster childrens. <laughs> Beyond the unfortunate rap singing, it's just kind of painfully generic to me. It's like it's like a throwaway Duran Duran track. A little. Yeah. Bit. 
For sure. It, it, yeah, yeah, definitely feeling that with sympathy vibe yeah. there. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, ever since the with sympathy episode, I've kind of made it a point to look up the credits of the album, we the albums that we review on Discogs, because uh, you never know what connections between the artists you might find. Um, a big part of what brought Why Can't Tori Reed down was a lack of support from their label. The big picture was released as a single, but achieved no major success, so Atlantic basically decided the rest of the album wasn't worth promoting. But looking at the credits attached to the album tells a very different story. <clears throat> this is from Discogs. Backing vocals include contributions from Rick Nielsen and Robin Zander of Cheap Trick. Mm -hmm. uh, session vocalist Mary Clayton, best known as the female vocalist on Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones. Uh, some big session names like uh, Paulinho da Costa. He worked with Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Celine Dion. Uh, on on auxiliary percussion, Vinnie Co, Co I'm going to say Kaliuta. Kala Kalayuta. I'm probably Kali saying Yuda. that wrong. Kalayuta. Thank you. <laughs> he works with Frank. He worked with Frank insist. Zappa. He worked. Yeah, and Joni Mitchell and Sting. Uh, Tim Landers on bass, as you mentioned. He mm -hmm. worked with Lou Rawls, Gil Evans, and Graham Nash, and uh, Fernando Saunders. He also worked on it on bass. He worked with Lou Reed, Jeff Beck, and Hart a lot. And as we mentioned at the top, Matt Sorum from those other bands. <laughs> I mean, there, there's great playing going yeah. on this whole record. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In general. You, you got to imagine that Atlantic had to have thought something of this record to put this much many talent and this many veterans on it at once. Yeah. And it, only for them to just completely abandon it is just kind of well, weird. Well, hang on. Remember, this came out in 88, so these veterans pretty much, I mean, Robin Zander and Rick Nielsen were at the bottom of their career yeah oh so that's... they were so they were just to, you know that. was this the flame time period? just before the flame <laughs> was that 89 yeah that was like late 88 89 it's weird of me to think that i was like alive while that song <laughs> but like i was five yeah actually in 89 <laughs> but um i was like two yeah but i mean yeah they they were probably just oh We'll sing on a song, give us 300 bucks, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, It's either this or go back to playing state fairs. <laughs> and and the only, I mean, Paulino da Costa was performing on everybody's album in the in the late 80s. Yeah, so. that's true. I mean, session <clears throat> musicians aren't really, they're not, they don't really, they're not really that picky about it. No. It's all just gigs to them. Right. So, yeah. oh, yeah, this is a good way to make, you know, four or $500 in a day, so... Sure, I'll play on that song. And I and, mean, um, the only veteran really at the time was Mary Clayton. Mm. So, <laughs> interesting points. Uh, now, now is probably as good a time as any since you mentioned like Cheap Trick during the 1980s. Um, my own, my coworker at work's theory that every band that was critically successful and acclaimed during the 60s and 70s put out their worst stuff during the 1980s. And Cheap Trick definitely fall out, fall into that category. Yeah. I oh, would, they I oh they did, but they they definitely came back at the end of the eighties, and they managed to ride that for about three years before the bottom fell out again. Right. <laughs> the old cheap trick van. Yeah, the cheap trick stocks. Oh, geez, we lost the bottom of our <laughs> I don't I don't remember again. Shaggy being a member of Cheap Trick. <laughs> yeah, he's the guy. He's the guy who, who plays the drums, right? <laughs> he plays the sandwiches. He plays the. Sand <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, uh, well, let's move a good sandwich. <laughs> yeah, sandwich you can barely fit in your mouth. Let's move on to track number four. Uh, this one is titled Fire on the Side. certainly a ballad uh yeah i i fucking loved this one i thought it was really? like yeah huh i i <laughs> would say that this was the most indicative of her future career that's i think that's why i think it's because it was like kind of coming off i the, don't know i think there's a much later track that's even more indicative i i'm sorry i interrupted there's a few there's definitely a few tracks this was i like, wouldn't say it's the most indicative though not the most but this was like the first well, maybe glimpse. maybe the Maybe the singles that she put out. It kind of had um, 
Yes, that yes, they were slow ballads, but they had a more um accessible approach yeah. to mm. it. More contemporary for the time. Yeah. I mean, I can see what you're saying. There's definitely some glimmers of, you know, future Tori Amos underneath all that, but the whole track was just too generic for me to really like it too much. It just yeah, felt I like it just that. felt like a love ballad. Like it was it was just like, oh, this sounds like What About Love by Heart, another band that made their worst stuff during the nineteen eighties. Yeah, oh for sure. And most commercially but, successful. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunate. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of at where, where you were at with uh whatever cool on your island where I just I felt like I, I just genuinely dug the arrangement and like liked how the chords mesh together is like very pretty mm. to me. I liked it and, and I don't know. I don't I don't dislike this track, but at this point the nicest thing that I can say is that after the cheesy eighties funk punch to the face of faith, this <laughs> this was kind of a relief for me. Yeah. It's like it was sure. like a more tolerable kind of eighties cheese while the last one was just an Aquanet kick to the balls. <laughs> an Aquanet kick to the balls. Okay. Maybe that's a podcast title. There you go. An Aquanet kick to the balls. And that would just be eighties eighties stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Each episode is about a single track. I there think that go. this was the song that had the bazooki on it. Or, or I'm sorry how that was. I, I am butchering that pronunciation. No, that that's how you pronounce it, bazooki. Is it really? Yes, yeah, bazooki. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the track that had that on it. I think. I thought there was bazooki on another track too. Maybe it was another track. I don't know. There's some sort of like fast picking, like Mediterranean style guitar that happens. That's super corny. Right. That was like my <laughs> one gripe. <laughs> with this song. Yeah. Like there's a lot of that kind of just like corny exoticism. I think that's like that definitely was like starting to get needed stale. To be, needed to be taken back a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. The, <laughs> Maybe mean, a bit. At the very least, like this is like one of the this is the first track on it where you can actually hear Tori Amos playing, you know, stretching out her classically trained piano chops a little bit. You yeah, know? for sure. Oh yeah. Right. All right. Let's move on to track number five with the uh, invigorating title, Pirates. Yeah, why the f- dude? It, like, why the fuck not? I'm because fucking pirates. Yeah, that's it, it, why. It, it's legal. It's legal to have a song <laughs> called Pirates. Okay, Lee. Like, do we, need, <laughs> we need to, we need to like bash this poor woman anymore. You know, after getting all emotional on the last track, it's, exactly. It's swashbuckling time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll. I like this song. All things I, considered, I, I like. I like this song. The lyrics, especially in the chorus, are pretty bad <laughs> yeah <I think> so. <laughs> i mean yeah, I think so. but no which, which, which part did you, which, number yeah, exactly. which part did you like the least the part where she said pirates or the part where she said pirates <laughs> right i mean the the melody is really really good yeah it's catchy well written i like the arrangements most of all because it's still very synth poppy but at the time at the same time being very ethereal and atmospheric mm. it's like a much more poppy, much more slap bass heavy, Echo and the Bunny Men a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Some or some similar post punk group. Yeah, there uh, there are some cool panning things happening on on I think this track definitely right. all over the album, but I I think in particular there is some uh, there is some hi hat that might have been swashbuckling across the. the uh, <laughs> Never heard of hi hat referred to as swashbuckling. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's swinging. Hi-hat? Yes, well, swinging from the uh, you know from the rafters there across your audio image. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm picking up the the remastered vinyl of this. I'm I'm doing this on old men yell at cloud. <laughs> Fuck him. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Cross oh. promotion. Oh yeah. I very badly need to hear uh, pirate metal band Alestorm do a cover of this song. <laughs> They've already done versions of Yo Ho Ho from Peter Pan and You Are a Pirate from Ooh. the children's show Lazy Town. So why not? Well, no, you see, I. It, wouldn't all that, all that joking great? aside, I could totally hear I'm not even, yeah, I'm not even joking about that. 
no, not, covering no, this no, song. Not, Repl- not hail, not hailstorm. Alestorm. Alestorm. Two, 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 two different bands. Oh, I don't know. Alestorm. Alestorm Hail is like a like a very modern, commercial a modern, rock band. A modern Lita Ford type band. Yeah. Alestorm is straight up pirate metal. Which oh, it, it's okay. literally I did not know that yeah. metal like with the pirate aesthetic. Right. With the which... pirate aesthetic and it incorporates like you know. Very like seafaring instrumentations, like pan flutes wow. and lutes and okay. stuff like you know that. What? I totally it's... heard hailstorm. Yeah, which if they replace the the synth, the synth background with guitars, they could totally pull that yeah. off. Hail hailstorm is <laughs> hailstorm is different named yeah. for their singer Lizzie Hale. Yeah, you remember hailstorm the, uh... is a storm of beer. I imagine. Okay, like A L E. Yes, A L E storm. You remember? Do uh, you remember the band Fin Troll by any chance? They were a Finnish I never band. Heard, I never heard them. I, I heard cannot of them. say I have. They were like a folk metal band. They or were a folk right? metal band, but like back in like you know 2004, they were probably the pirate metal band. They were the requisite mm. band that I would refer to as pirate metal because mm. there's just like there's a lot of like yo ho hoing to their like <laughs> vocal style and oh, like good Lord. to the chord progression. <laughs> <laughs> like flogging Molly, only more obvious. <laughs> oh, God. The band I always think of when I think of folk metal is uh, there's a band called Agaloch. I think they've broken up. Yeah, but they think- basically had a song where, as percussion, like one of their members just hits a deer skull every so often, <laughs> and that's that's folk metal. That's Yikes. Agaloch. I mean, <laughs> anyway. good on them. <laughs> This is the song I picture the most when I'm looking at the cover to Why Can't Tori Read. The oh, cover definitely. Album, definitely. The cover of which features Amos standing against a class picture day background. Yep. Oh, yeah. Wearing a, gl- <laughs> wearing a glittery bustier and holding a cutlass. I read in an online interview that uh, Joe Ciccarelli initially gave Tori the very same sword as a gift because she was going through a pirate phase. Oh, right. As we, yeah, all, there ha- we, go. As we all have <laughs> gone through. She still has that. And... Yeah. That sword. Oh, does she? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. I've seen, I've I've seen it in photos, like in the last ten years. Like if she's working in the working in her studio, it's sitting up on a wall or something like that. She's like, while you were out all partying, I was studying the blade. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I can kill you with a thought. It's worth mentioning that that same album artwork probably hindered why can't Tori Reed from developing in more ways than one. Uh, there's an infamous Billboard magazine review that pointed that out, which frequently and unfairly gets taken out of context. Uh, here's the quote in referring to the album. Uh, Classically trained pianist pounds the ivories on her pop rock debut, belting out self-written material with a forceful, appealing voice. Unfortunately, provocative packaging sends the inaccurate message that this is just so much more bimbo music. Guess which part a lot of people honed in on. Oh, I'm sure the second half that, of that, that might have been taken out of context. That review on the stuck internet. with Amos for decades, and mm. it almost caused her to quit music entirely, unfairly so. Yeah. And it's something that she's brought up in interviews like a lot, which is just, you know, incredibly unfair. Yeah. Which it which I find kind of funny because <laughs> I mean it, I, I don't I mean, they largely stopped talking about that probably around Boys for Pele because she she had firmly established herself as c- someone completely different than right. what we see on the cover of Why Can't Tori Read. Right. And uh, you say, I, I don't remember any of those kind of interviews. I mean, I, when in doing my research, especially when I saw this was being re-released, I, I looked at she There was a couple of articles where she mentioned it and she said, yeah, I'm over it now. I remastered it, and now it's coming out again. Hey, and uh, yeah, I saw that. That uh, well, when I say interviews, I mean much earlier too. interviews. Obviously, she's made peace with it now. Yeah. Number six, shall we? Yeah. This one is titled "Floating City." the when we were listening to that clip uh, Phil and I were engaging in some little voguing right there 
Little bit of voguing, yes. I to bring Madonna back into the <laughs> story again. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. We won't say Madonna anymore. God. <laughs> so yeah, we were we were we were, to- we were we were totally grooving on that chorus because yeah, <laughs> so, I I like this song a lot. I wrote fuck this song bumps too. That what? was my <laughs> that was my notes. <laughs> well, the, for the, for this particular song, I kept thinking of um, of hearts these dreams. Oh yeah, especially in the chorus. Uh, mm. I liked it better than these dreams. Yeah. Oh, d- I definitely did too because I. Fucking hated these dreams. <laughs> that is a supermarket suicide song for sure. Oh yes, my God. totally. <laughs> That's like you're stocking the shelves at Victory Supermarket. Yes, and you hear that. And then these all dreams. Of a, and all of a sudden, you realize your place in the universe. Yes, yeah. which is yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it opens with some really dark ambience and some all percussive strings, reminiscent of a. Heavily reverberated industrial act. I mean, percussive stings, not strings. <laughs> and then that really cool, like, it was kind of cheesy on Cool on Your Island. Here, the marimbas sound really give it some atmosphere. It's like an Oingo mm. Boingo song a little bit. Yeah. I, it, remi- I, it reminds me of Insanity a lot. Yeah, it was it was just the right amount where it wasn't like, it wasn't obvious. It was just like to kind of give it a little bit of quirk yeah. to it. Mm. There's some, Which is, uh, I, I think, definitely worked in, works in her favor. Yeah, on, there's on a, a lot of times. There's some semblances of 80s pomp on there, but it's a much swarthier, ethereal, next Scarfy take on it. Mm. Like, there's a distinct vibe I get from it that Amos is trying very hard to replicate the sound that you'd normally get from a from a Peter Gabriel or, as we mentioned earlier, Kate Bush. Yeah. And you know what? I like to think that if either of them picked up this, if, like, Kate Bush or Peter Gabriel picked up this song and, like, it was just written by Tori Amos, they probably would have had a hit. Like yeah. a genuine hit. Mm. It just had the unfortunate distinction of being a Why Can't Tori Reed song well be- <laughs> well before Tori Amos found her niche. Mm. You know? Yeah. It's oh well. it's really starting to make me think like the wrong song was chosen as the big promotional single. If they were if like as we mentioned, they were trying to find an American Kate Bush. So you know? I'm gonna mention that uh this this album had the best rating out of I think all of the albums we've reviewed thus far, yeah, uh, on all music, it, it on allmusic.com, which is oh, you know I, I love I, allmusic.com. Yeah, it, it's yeah. they it's should, they should hire source. us as critics they and should. like pay us twenty five dollars a review or something like that. Like, oh, all, yeah. Allmusic.com, oh, yeah. host this podcast on your Please. website. <laughs> we're not asking, we're not asking much. We're just asking you to host this on your website. <laughs> uh, yeah, it gave it three out of five stars. Yeah. You don't you don't have to come on and review anything except Stephen Thomas Erlewine. Come on the podcast. Oh, pl- oh yes, come on, Mark Deming. Like the, between a- those two, that's like half of the reviews on all music. <laughs> yeah, he he does a lot. Yeah, uh, Steve, th- is Stephen er- Erlewine. Oh yeah, yeah. I think he might have been one of the founders. He, yeah, he must have. Been. I wouldn't doubt they it. They gave yeah. him like all the stinkers just because. Yeah, like- that's that's the name that like we pretty. When we're looking up reviews, allmusic.com is the first place that we go to, and very frequently, Stephen Thomas Erlewine has been popping up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like I said, either Stephen Thomas Erlewine or Mark Deming. Right. I forget who We don't know these people, but... I didn't. Re- I want to like shake their hands and say your reviews are frighteningly accurate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah seriously. Yeah, for I the didn't. Mo- oh, sorry. I didn't. I didn't jot down who wrote uh, the review for this album or like any choice quotes from it because right, yeah. it was a very standard sort of yeah, this album's all right kind of review. This exists. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've read reviews on all music where it's, yeah, an album of rockers and ballads, three stars. <laughs> no, really? It, was, it wasn't like... It the, was, Stephen Thomas Erlewine clearly did not write, write that one. But. No. It wasn't like the Attila review where Stephen Thomas Erlewine was just like, if you like, oh, this, wow. al- if you like this album, you're a fucking asshole. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Shame on you. Uh, I, I, on one of my radio shows... That I've done in the past, I've I've read that entire review on the air. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I, mean, I think it's that's epic. Sti- I think and that's still the worst was... reviewed song album that we've done, right? Oh, probably. Yeah, it's a one. But um, we, we actually played a track from that on the radio. Was it one, and was it Wonder Woman? No, it wasn't. <laughs> really? I'm trying to remember oh, which one it was. You done fucked up. That's the best track on the album. <laughs> 
No, but, but yeah, we played a song because um, one of the shows that I had does like obscure classic rock, mm. and Attila is definitely fit fits the bill. So mm. we did that, and I read the entire review, and I and. God, when did I do this? Like 10 years ago or something like that. Yeah. Like White Stripes was just breaking. Wow. And so <clears throat> I uh I read the review and then I added if this if this album came out in 2007, people would have said it was the savior of heavy music. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I I mean I I would I would definitely agree with that and and definitely it I definitely think that the white stripe. I think Jack White's biggest influence is definitely Billy Joel, like by far. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's um, inarguable. But it. But I just just in the way that the white stripes were just lavishly praised, right? Where it was basically amplified blues structures. Yeah. Mm. They were just punishingly retro, right? And so something like that would have had you know five million dollar ad campaigns and aggressive promotion on the radio and and MTV at the time and I was just convinced that if that album came out I think that album came out in 1970 yeah they're and, basically the black keys of, of 1970 yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean cuz it cuz when cuz that was the first that was the first jukebox zeros right yeah, yeah that was our first episode yeah i remember listening to that and 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 I had that CD too. <laughs> oh my god! I didn't know that was even printed on CD. Um, not in the U.S., but it was printed for a very brief time in Japan, <laughs> Japan or Germany, I think. Oh, man. That, is, that is the. Best. I actually had the CD. Like I how, somehow obtained a copy of that CD. So that I, is that is the. I've best. been meaning to I love that. All right, well, I, I'm just going to bring up this last story, and then we yep. should probably move on to the yeah, next yeah, yeah. But I've been meaning to bring this up on the past few episodes where. Uh, I, one one of my uncle in laws, uh, God bless his heart, showed us a uh, showed us a documentary this one night. <laughs> it was um, it was of the what's what's the name of the old Mets stadium that that they recently closed? Shea down? Stadium. Yeah, I think it's Shea Stadium. So it was like a documentary on like the clo- the last concert that they played oh, at yeah. Shea Stadium. Didn't he play the last? He concert? did. Yeah, he played the last concert at Shea Stadium. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a documentary on that, uh, and like most of it was like biography of billy joel which of course mm-hmm. was like very uh seemed very heavily skewed by billy joel himself hmm. one of which being like the attila album they like barely mentioned the fact that it was like critically hated just that like he was wild and like <laughs> yeah. oh yeah but it, it was pretty cool i actually like it and, like billy joel was actually like speaking fondly of it hmm. and really here's the here's the weird thing which was at one point, we were talking about uh, Cold Spring Harbor or whatever right. the fuck. His, his, yeah. first, yeah, his, his first, first solo legit, record. Yeah. yeah, His first solo record. The and, one that had all those production problems. There, yeah, there was a production <laughs> error. And on the documentary, he said that the 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 raise and pitch that, like, I thought that was a, it was just a production error was actually done on purpose <laughs> because apparently oh the record company didn't think his, like, his voice was like young marketable enough. enough or young enough or yeah. something. So they, so they sounds raised about it up. right. <laughs> so that, I mean that, that could very well be true, but it's just funny if the, the, this, this new conspiracy theory has been brought to life. And this is just like the, the Billy Joel saga just yeah. thickens as all, you know, the music yeah. industry, it's full of conspiracies. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Indeed. We are definitely getting to either that or river of dreams on a future episode. Oh Yeah. yeah. For, For now, sure. though, uh, we're moving on to track number seven. Uh, this one is titled uh, Heart Attack at 23. Oh, man. oh no! Synchronicity three. Or I something? was just starting to come around on this album too. <laughs> yeah, oh, this one's goodness. pretty stinky. Yeah. So I, it's funny because the beginning of it is so yeah, it's, unassuming. It's, oh it's, yes, it sneaks Very up on you. At fir- it sneaks up on you at first. Tori Amos is sort of plunking the ivories. There's some spoken word, and then boom, white wedding. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my note was, so, uh, th- this sounds like a typical Tory. This- oh, wait. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, what is going on here? And there's a sax solo. There's a, we got there's a little a sax, sax solo. solo. There's a uh, sax solo, a guitar solo, and yeah. strangely enough, just an acoustic guitar pops up in that <laughs> yes. same section. I'm so glad we. I was waiting for a fucking saxophone. Like, of course there's a fucking saxophone on this album. Uh, not to... Just look at the album cover. <laughs> Not to tie it back into With Sympathy once again, but oh, this track feels like the equivalent of What He Say. It has, oh, yeah. It has one specific singular sound that it's honing in on with intense precision and focus. It's a sound that's the antithesis of what the artist would eventually become, and it's incredibly uncomfortable and cringy the whole way through. Oh, for, yeah. mi- for Ministry, it was Duran Duran-style New Wave dance, and for Why Can't Tori Read, it's Blondie-style New Wave punk. Yeah, I'm not really sure what she was trying to go for here. Yeah. This is like this is the second time I've made a negative comparison to Blondie. I wonder <laughs> I wonder if I just don't like them and just didn't realize it until now. I, I think like Blond- Blondie's fine. It's it's maybe the people who who ripped them off. That's, maybe that truly suck. Uh, this is one of two songs from Why Can't Tori Read that she hasn't adapted to her current style, and I can see why. I yeah, can, I can see why too, and I'm going to. Be the unpopular opinion. Oh, no. Oh, here we go. I actually like this song what? a lot. Expl- <laughs> explain yourself. It's and, it, and strangely enough, it's for the very reasons that you both don't like it. Oh, dear. It Because it's so far le- out of left field and it's and it's like kind of punky and and it's it basically in. After what the first thirty seconds, the the whatever the piano intro is, once it once the drums and guitars kick in, yeah, it's every everything that Tori is not. So this is this album's Beach Patrol, you would say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. wow. And um, and for some reason, that's what I like about it. It's that it's the complete antithesis wow. of. Of what Tori is, I know I, I can totally feel that. I I, Hot I can understand that. Yeah, Hot it's, take from Phil Fleming. Yeah, it, it's it. I don't know. It, it, it just my more alt rock mind just having something, just latching onto something completely out of character for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is what is so appealing about it to me. I mean, the title sucks. <laughs> but... <laughs> <All right. laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if it's a worse title than Faith, though. No, it doesn't it's, age well. No, you know? it hasn't. <laughs> but, but I don't know. It, it, I mean, you don't hear her like that no. ever. True. So that that's kind of what I like about it. I, yeah, yeah, it's just so wild, so yeah. wacky. Like it, it might as well be PJ Harvey. It's like exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's just such a strange. Which that's... oh man, if this was a PJ Harvey <laughs> song, that would be something. Oh yeah. Oh, this would make a great PJ Harvey song. <laughs> <laughs> Might be less tropical bits if it was. Oh, you never know. That's it's going true. through a tropical. It would phase. almost certainly have bazooki on it, though. Oh yes. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I don't know if that's enough to save it for me, though. Right. Yeah. And well, it, it, just just growing up, especially around as much music as I like to be around, having having the unpopular opinion seems to be the norm for me. Mm. So, yeah, that's your fault. Oh, we all need a devil's and, advocate. That's it, your fallback. Right, yeah, kind of devil's advocate. That's fine. And uh, and it's it's always that thing, I love it for the same reason you hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so That's always uh, fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's always fun. <laughs> it makes me very unpopular. <laughs> uh Track number eight. What do you say we move on to that? Sure. Uh, This one is titled On the Boundary. Little palate cleanser from uh, Blondie right there. Back to <laughs> lyrical arrangement experimentation. Uh, it's 
more evocative of Amos's later works. Yeah. And oh, definitely. This this is the one with the bazooki on it, I think. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> this was the one that I wrote. Also sounds like typical Tori Amos, but through right. the cheesy 80s filter, which yeah. uh, we, we've uh, we've touched on that a few times. Yeah. It does point. sound like Tori Amos, but at the same time, it sounds so much like Pat Benatar as well. Oh, totally, yeah. So oh, that, that Benatar yes. Rasp. I did not think of that. Yeah. That's a very good comparison. That's who I was trying to think of. Yeah, Pat Benatar. That yeah, particular especially... camera. Especially like uh, mid '80s Pat Benatar when right. she was trying to experiment with more poppy things rather than just charging hard rock. Yeah, more reverb. Right. Yeah, it feels it feels like another song that probably also could have been a single if Atlantic had given it a little bit more uh, faith. It, yes, given it like you know two years running start, not right. released it in 1988, <laughs> right. but like. <laughs> Yes, we were moving that, on to like New yeah. Jack Swing at that point. <laughs> we were in the future. Are you going to reference New Jack Z- Swing in every episode? Of Absolutely. <laughs> I'm bringing it back, baby. Oh, there you go. Heather's going to be so angry. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! No, but yeah, the, that now you see that particular song was evocative of what would end up on Little Earthquakes. Mm-hmm. I mean, because it. You can draw a correlation between that particular song and uh, "Crucify." Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, like, I can rhythmically, kind of see that. same kind of same kind of arrangement. Maybe, maybe less um, n- less keyboard, more piano. Yeah, but uh, definitely in the wheelhouse. It's definitely heavier on the pomp than uh, mm. than "Crucify" for yeah. sure. Oh yeah, and I don't know if she's Crucify using is a... A, "Crucify" is just a little bit more sort of subdued. Yeah. Exactly. A little more minimalist. And right. I, I don't know if she's using a Yamaha CP80 on, on this record, but... I think she was using it all over the record. <laughs> well, she definitely does it all, all throughout Little Earthquakes, because that was mm. like a that was like a home studio recording, basically. Not not, not her well, home. She's, a, she's only ever done, I think, one album in a proper studio. Oh, is that right? I mm. think Under the Pink was done in a proper studio. Yeah. Everything else was... A house recording, a converted mm. church, and recorded then she built her own studio. Like mm. Recorded yeah. in a barn or something like that. Yeah. That kind of yeah, thing. Did, yeah, her studio now is, I think, a converted barn. Wow. So, <laughs> But anyway, anyway, like be, because of that, it, it was kind of a cheap, cheap-ish or, or like lower budget production. Mm. And, and like there's definitely still some eight, like 80s hangover reverb happening on, on this, mm. this album that came out in 1992. Right. Mm. Uh, like very like lo-fi, but in the most poppiest sense of the like the most poppiest it was a, the most poppiest inter- interpretation of lo-fi that you can think of. Absolutely <laughs> right. Well, it, I mean, it was probably mixed for radio and all right. that. that that's true. That yeah. So there's probably a rough mix out there somewhere. Yeah. That I, I actually do like the production on Little Earthquakes quite a bit. Mm, it, yeah. It's it, it, at times is very understated, <laughs> right. especially compared to this fucking album. <laughs> Oh yes, yeah. there's there's nothing understated about this album for the most part. No, no uh, sir. Let's move on to track number nine. We're starting to reach the end. Uh, this one is titled "You Go to My Head." <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, who, I who mean, it? it it has the unfortunate distinction of being the second to last track, and that's almost always like a filler track in most albums. Sometimes it's like my favorite track. Yeah, yeah so, sometimes generally, there's some good ones. Generally, on a 10-song album, my favorite track is usually eight or nine. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I've, like... I've always been a side two guy, Yo, I if know that makes mean. sense. As mm. opposed to B-sides, just side two of the album. Which is usually after track. If it's six. arranged well, it, it yeah. is like you know, ah, you know, right, kiss exactly. anus. But I uh, mean, it's a perfectly fine song. Yeah, but that's really the most I can say about it. Very and it's still, new romantic. Yeah, any sort of poetic license or aesthetics that are to be had from it is kind of lost among all the decade-specific tropes too. Yeah. It's 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 weird to hear her talking about how the unspecified love interest from the song should make a slave of her. When there's so many other later songs that she would write that were a bit more liberating subject matter. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For that sure. Was, that raised an eyebrow for me. 
uh, you know, just yeah. naive. Well, the, this songwriting. this track, the, this track for me was just quintessentially 1988 pop. That's, yeah, that's that's a fair that's a fair uh, categorization. Like funky bass line, yeah, kind of oh, yeah. kind just swinging enough drums. Yep, and. Just, just enough to get people to dance like a abc bit. sort of or is this like uh, this is later than ABC. later well later abc which wasn't so new wave and more mm. romantic oh yeah like motowny kind oh of that's thing. right yeah the old smoky song yeah right. when smoky sings thing. or when smoky sings which came out a year before this like record sim- like so. simply red or something like that um, or is that too like easy listening yeah no that simply red was always too easy listening which I found hilarious, considering Simply Red was inspired by Sex Pistols. Oh boy! Uh, like, Simply really? Red. <laughs> Simply Red. The guys, in my opinion, responsible for the absolute worst Talking Heads cover ever. Oh, which one? They did a cover of Heaven on one of their albums. That is just god awful. I, I don't remember I think, that. I think it was Heaven. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's it's bad. <laughs> okay, that is was that, the worst cover ever. Is that your impression of Simply Red? No, that's my <laughs> cover of me doing the worst cover of heaven ever. So I wanted to take it away from from simply red. I think they uh, honorable mention. <laughs> all right, there we go. Fair enough. I could do worse. I know I can. Of all the, I could do it if I try. Put me in, coach. Yeah. <laughs> Mentioned like there are only two songs on uh, Why Can't Tori Read that haven't been adapted to her new song. This is the other one. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's it's Heart Attack at 23 and You Go to My Head. These ones haven't been, have not been performed by Tori Amos in her current, you know, artistic uh, version. Oh, okay. Interesting. I mean. she hates those songs too. I guess so. You see, I don't don't hate this song though. I hated Heart Attack at 23. I don't hate, uh, I don't hate You Go to My Head. It's just, that's just kind of a nothing burger for me. (laughs) Nothing burger. (laughs) Just plain. It's just like white. The meat. No, it's, it, just, it, it's just a Burger King patty on a bun, and that's all. No, no it's not, not even a freshly made one, just there one that's been sitting out under the heat lamp for a little while. <laughs> Oof. No, I, it, it's definitely, definitely a filler track. It would have been like the fourth single had it had the other three been successful. Mm, you know? Right. Maybe. Yeah, right. that's how I kind of saw it. And now we're approaching the very end. Uh, this is track number 10 with the uh, very long title, Etienne Trilogy. Parentheses, The Highlands, Etienne, Skyboat Song. Getting proggy on us. Tori. Yep. Oh, yeah. This is the big epic, letting epic the, song. Uh, letting the Kate Bush freak flag fra- flop. <laughs> <laughs> the Kate Bush freak flag fly. Here, here's a song. Let's use Phil's. <laughs> When I disagreed with you guys about, I think it was fire on the side. You guys said was the most indicative of the path that Tori Amos would go on. Yeah. This one, this is the song that I feel like is most Tori Amos modern. Tori yeah. Amos. Well, I, well, I said it, it well, like the Etienne the Etienne portion of the song definitely. Yeah. Mm. Um, I feel like it's all too appropriate that this is the song that closes. Why can't Tori read out? Because like this is what Tori Amos would become basically. Which would be a bagpipes player. Uh, <laughs> uh, so so that's, Skyboat was... Uh, yeah, was, that's, a tr- that's a traditional old Scottish song, I think. Yeah, so that was performed by a young Jonathan Davis of the Corn. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's yes, why, that's the why, Corn. <laughs> that's why when it's fading out, you can just barely make out him going, Orn! <laughs> that's disturbed. Get your get your shitty new it's metal all the right. Same. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I went ooh wah ah, 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 not no no. I that's went, disturbed. Ooh, that's wah, disturbed, ah, ooh, dude. Wah, ah, ooh, wah, ah. Oh and god. And then disturbed is more. Mm, wah, ah. <laughs> Why are we discussing this? <laughs> Please no. <laughs> Talk about Tori Avis here today. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. A perfectly fine song on its own, but in the full retrospect context of the album, I feel like it's damn near cathartic. 
because I mean, there's one important line that I want to point out from the chorus that really ties into that idea. By the morning, maybe we'll remember who I am. It's kind of especially poignant considering like the very next album Amos would release would not just be the commercial breakthrough, but the artistic breakthrough. Mm. Little Earthquakes, that was the turning point. It'd, it'd be the point where she like, you know, really discovers and cements that artistic identity. And it's it's kind of uplifting to think about that because there's just so many ill-fitting tracks. I mean, if you think about it, this album kind of had to get made in order for her to get that all out of her system. Yeah, for sure. Got to get yeah. all that fucking sparkly 80s glitter out of your ass. I... I, I, <laughs> I I mean, I, I have, I kind of have a theory behind the, behind the whole, the whole album and the whole Tori Amos mm. mystique mm. for her entire tenure at Atlantic Records. I mean, for one, I'm shocked that they kept her after the abysmal failure of this initial failure of this album. The one that Wikipedia hated. The one that Wikipedia <laughs> said nothing on. No, but um, nobody like they, said a word. They, they, they kept her on. Which I found weird because even in 1988, if you didn't sell, you know, 100,000 copies, you were probably going to get dropped. Right. So, like, they kept her around. And, it, yeah, I, I thought that was really odd. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder I wonder why that was. Or, um, or just, well, they were just willing to... I mean, it, they, they were well, just I mean, that impressed by the songs that, that, that she brought to the table afterwards. Maybe. maybe. I mean, it, I was just looking at the background behind Little Earthquakes because that had a long gestation period too. Yeah, I'm mean, like she had a whole she had a whole album's worth of stuff in 1990 that Atlantic passed on, uh-huh. and so she started doing it, you know, tiny budget style in in her boyfriend's house. Right. And, <clears throat> And, I mean, uh, if anything, that tiny budget thing probably endeared her to Atlantic a little more because. I mean, after Why Can't Tori Reed failed, she probably would have really had to, oh, yeah. you know, you know, impressed Atlantic at that point. And it certainly would have helped to be like, oh, she can do these albums that sell really well under budget. Right. right. Yeah, totally. And take, you know, looking at it from a strictly but, corporate angle. I mean, my, my, my impression, especially after looking at this cover, I can see why maybe Atlantic signed her as opposed <laughs> to a band and thinking that they could have a new pop rock starlet. Mm. Right. And so they they hooked her up with a producer. She wanted to do more crazier material. Right. More Kate Bush. More, more Kate Bush with Kate Bush with louder guitars, I right. suppose. And um all the nineteen eighty eight spit and polish bells and whistles. Right. The whole thing and then when that failed they wanted to keep her around because they still saw dollar signs or mm -hmm. something and i mean because anyone who followed tori amos in the 90s atlantic promoted the shit out of her mm -hmm. like they released they were were trying to, so hard to have her get a pop hit and they never got one mm -hmm. yeah i honestly could they came tell close you. twice but like two or three I mean, times, she had she had hits, just not on not the top, top. Yeah. not the top, not the 40 hot one hundreds. She had yeah. hits like all on over modern the rock, alternative and charts, and alternative, the adult yeah. alternative charts, and that sort of thing. And she has a very very devoted fan base. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Which, which speaking of which, we maybe see this it. is a good time to bring up the why can't Tori Reid fan page, right? After there's we, a fan page? I didn't know there was a oh, fan yeah. page. Oh, yeah. When we were promoting nice. the episode on our Facebook page, like oh, just I just sort of tagged it thinking, oh, this must be the page for the album. And all sorts of people just started liking, you know, our post about it. So we'd be remiss if we didn't shout out the Why Can't Tori Read fan page for, oh, you know, yeah. your interest in, now, now, in this podcast that you probably didn't even know existed until now. <laughs> no, it, now that I'm thinking about it, somebody actually messaged me about it really Do you know when it's coming out i said well stay tuned on the jukebox zeros page oh my god yeah that's amazing <laughs> I mean, yeah i wish i had some like more substantial things to say <laughs> <laughs> as usual uh, uh, no but it, i mean for for her entire tenure at atlantic they they were trying really really hard to make her a pop star with whatever she was doing hmm. i mean you can't, you're not going to hear God sometimes you just don't come through on top 40 radio. You're right. just not. Sure. 
but they tried really hard. And it's and it, and she was like she was too edgy for pop, but like also kind of too soft for for like alt rock. For alt rock as it was at the time. Yeah, yeah at the time, like she because that's still when like, grunge was just starting to break yeah. out. Yeah, and and so I mean she she had some substantial hits. She had a lot yeah. of substantial hits, right? But it was just alternate alternative rock radio. Yeah, yeah. and uh, oh yeah, this it. This is a break from Nirvana here. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, here's Nirvana. Now is silent all these years. <laughs> <laughs> this makes sense. Yeah. All right. So that about does it for the album. What do you say we get into our final thoughts? Let's get into the beef. All right. Do you think this is a worst of all time album? Uh, Patrick, do you want to start? I do. Uh, I do not. I, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> genuinely enjoyed this album uh yeah and i'm like and i would probably listen to it again Mm. uh yeah i i think it's kind of coming off the high of of like discovering that i like tori in this because i had never listened to her before and uh i've i've only gotten through like the first couple albums so far but i've listened to each of them like five times through already Mm. like Mm. I, i i dug it that much wow yeah Awesome. Nice. Very good. Very uh, Phil, do you think this is a worst album of all time? I have a feeling I know it's Absolutely your not. Be. Absolutely not. All right. I, it, is, <laughs> it is not the worst album. Um it 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 definitely answers a couple of questions for me because as as someone of, of Tori's fame uh as someone that is a fan of Tori fam- Amos's work. Hearing her produced, because she largely produced her own stuff mm-hmm. after this. Right. She was produced by somebody else. Right. So Joe Ciccarelli. Joe Ciccarelli. And, oh, I just made a noise with the CD. All right. Oh, we've been making noises <laughs> the whole podcast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um... I especially with her with her later work, as after the 21st century, have been very indulgent... Mm-hmm. Like a lot, when you go through Tori Amos's uh, catalog, you, you get a lot of albums that are really long and can probably lose a few songs and still make its point. Right. I I largely attribute that to her producing her own material and... It gets you know, very insular after a while. It, right. Just, that's when you and start so, piling on so something all like, these songs. Something like this, you have somebody else saying, okay, don't do that, do that. So it was a moment where Tori was, was like being reined in yes, at that point. that's it. Which is I mean, kind of interesting I can, I can only imagine if she made, a, she made an album now that was produced by somebody other than herself. Right. Or and, just seeing uh, her part of like a collaborative process, even, right, is, is sort of interesting. Mm. I, I got it. That's gotcha. it, that that that's that's what this particular album brings out to me. Like this is how she would sound if she had somebody behind the console that had and had a had mindset of commercial commercial success, right? Mm. But I yeah. guess a fair amount of the you know creative input was from her end as well. That was kind of yeah. There's a, a there's small... been in, there's been interviews where uh, the producer Joe Ciccarelli had said uh, at the time Tori was incredibly satisfied with the end results. Right. As she was very vocal about like you know things that she wanted to be included. Right. Or, or how she wanted it to sound. Yeah. All right. What about you, Lee? As for me, uh, I have all kinds of mixed feelings about this album. On the one hand, there's some very cringy songs on here that lower my opinion of it. But at the same time, there's some genuinely great stuff on here. And it's all it's all too plausible that, like, Tori Amos had a vision and that somewhere down the line it got perverted by Atlantic Records, either, you know, in sound or in marketing, right on down to the really unfortunate album cover giving the worst impression. Yeah, seriously. I, I would say it would be more marketing because the sound is very 1988. Yeah. And... I mean, it, yeah, having her in a in a bustier with big, you know, fucking Aquanet hair, right? Probably and gave, sword <laughs> and the sword. <laughs> probably, the sword. probably gave the wrong impression to somebody who has not he who did not hear the big picture 
right on the radio or on MTV like the for, one for, and a half yeah. times they played it you know yeah and um definitely doesn't give off that she's a classical classically trained pianist and, and you know but, singer but on the other hand Atlantic Records especially at that time had a horrible tendency to mismarket anything that wasn't hard rock. Right. That's mm. something worth mentioning is that uh, Tori Amos was discovered by Atlantic Records. Yeah. She didn't like, you know, come up onto like an indie label or anything like yeah, that. She, yeah. They discovered her. Right. Yeah. And um it's, it's, if it if it wasn't hard rock, they didn't really know how to promote anything mm. that wasn't well, hard rock or dance, dance pop, because mm. it because especially in in the late eighties, that's what Atlantic was good for, like dance pop and hard rock. Yeah, and for someone who kind of treaded the line between the two, it was a little, it was almost too easy to miss market her. Yeah, for <laughs> sure, I can I can see that. Yeah. I, anyway, getting back to my opinion, mm-hmm. I'd say the album has foreshadowing spots of greatness throughout of it, and that really its worst crimes are that it's that Amos's considerable talents are just being either frequently wasted and misused or just hidden behind a wall of yeah. 80s pop rock excess. It's more of a tragic tale than it lets yeah. on, but is it a worst album of all time? Absolutely not. I mean, if ever there was a case of like not judging an album by its cover... <laughs> That that's a definite one for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I I think I really think that like if this album came out three years earlier, it would have it would have oh, been a, a little smash. Better. Yeah. And I think I think the fact that it came out in 1988 that like people were just ready to move on to the next to the right. next thing, Absolutely. the next sort of production point. We were sort of like this felt sort of like you know kind of normy right. or, or old hat. Um, Uh, Obviously, like, Tori Amos has been, you know, going back to these songs and playing them again live in concerts. I would be genuinely interested to see to have, like, the album re-recorded entirely in her modern style. It's a real testament. Just to see where it goes. It's a real testament to how, like, like what a great fucking songwriter she is that that Mm, she can go back and, like, actually... Mm. Because the songs are solid. The songs are like well written. Like mm-hmm. there are maybe a few points that are like kind of naive. Yeah, you but could, like you could change a lyric here. Or... Yeah, but like right. yeah. but like the songs and chords and melodies. Oh, they're yeah. all like or change very, one arrangement. Very sophisticated. So yeah. yeah, yeah. What would you say is your favorite or least bad track, Patrick? <laughs> uh, fuck. Uh, fire on your side. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite or least bad track? Good heart Phil. attack at twenty three. Oh nice. boy. Yeah, uh, I, I know you guys hate it, but you know, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> fuck me, indeed. You, you don't say that on our podcast. <laughs> this is highly irregular. Uh, my favorite, Floating City. Hmm. It is. I love that track. Yeah, I liked it too. That that was the one that I said fucking bumped. I, I enjoyed it on my headphones. True, truer words have never been spoken. Uh, now, what would you say is your least favorite track, Patrick? Uh, cool on your island. I oh. just. I mean, I I liked it. That all, makes me sad. I know. I, I liked it up until the the like island vocals come in, and you know, uh, what uh, Phil brought up earlier that the, that there's Spanish guitars on here, but there you know, and there's Spanish guitars, and there's like island vocals, so there's like a there's a there's a there's bit too of much, a there's too much stuff going on for you. Uh, no, it's not even that. There's just a mix of cultures here that probably should have been a little you know better thought out. <laughs> Fair enough. What is your least favorite track, uh, Phil? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna go with "Cool on Your Island" too. Oh, um, what? what? <laughs> okay. Are we supposed to have different ones? Fuck! No, 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 no we don't have. No, to have you don't have ones. to. Have di- you don't have to have different ones. I mean, uh, you can if you want to, though. <laughs> I mean, the, sake of time. I mean, the, that's it. That's probably the track I. I liked the least. Mm. I mean, because I mean, at at its worst, it's you know passable background music. Yeah, you know, and even even on songs like Faith, there's there's hooks there that that you can actually hear. So sure. it, I, I'll say, "Cool on your island." Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. yeah. The, well, the, I mean, because it's okay to not like it, a song. I mean, the the other one that it might be "Floating City," just because it reminds me of that goddamn heart song. Oh. So. 
Oh, man. Breaking Lee's Heart. Those were two songs I liked the most. Yeah. Really? No, no. Well, just for that, my worst, fav- my least favorite track is Heart Attack at 23. How do you like that? <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> fuck you, Phil. Fuck you. 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 All right. And, uh, Perfect. No, but uh, is that seriously your least favorite? Yeah, I, okay. had, I had either Heart Attack at 23 or Faith, but I think I like Heart Attack at 23 less. Okay. Now that I think of it. So. Agree, to, agree to disagree. Yeah. So yeah. fuck you, Phil. And thank you for coming on the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. This oh, was, no, this is fun. This was so much fun. Yeah, this was, we this definitely got to have you back again sometime down the it, line. It, and I'll recommend another reviled album that we all surprisingly <laughs> like. Yeah. No, seriously, uh, as always, your your wisdom is is welcome and, and enjoyed. Oh, and, absolutely. And I'm, just, I'm just glad there's... This was, there's a, this was a very sumptuous episode. Well, excellent. No, I'm just glad that there's some sort of podcast that where i can use my total nerd knowledge on <laughs> that's, that's uh, like what we why we do this we, we got to get it off our chest yeah, absolutely one way or another we're, we're dorks we we're are total dorks. dorks indeed do you have anything that you want to plug at this um, moment no just uh on the town with mikey d wednesday nights nine to midnight i'm one of the rotating djs and I did an excellent episode last Wednesday where I played all RPM challenge albums, of which Patrick made one. Whoa. Yes, thank so, you. So yes, you want to plug that, uh, Pat? Yes. Uh, yeah, eventually we'll, we'll wait for. Phil. We don't. We don't usually plug stuff so much, but. Uh... Oh, oh no! I'll plug his album. It's called <laughs> Smell. The album's <laughs> titled Woof, which is, <laughs> and and it has a nice, awesome. Uh, it's dog statue picture on the cover. <laughs> yeah, it, it is those things. Thank you. And yeah, and, I, I can, and if you I want can, some crazy art music, this yeah, I, is for, this is the album I can for you. It's a really good album. Oh, thank oh, yeah. you. Very proggy, very like very left of the dial and like in the most artsy kind of melt banana y kind of way. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Those are very kind words. I, I'm trying to make art and or art oh, fart. You, you definitely made art. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> All right, Lee, what do you got? Um, these I actually days? do have something to plug this time around. Uh, if you tune in uh, to my friend uh, Scott Curland, he has a podcast called uh, Writer's Bagel Basket, where they take uh, single episodes or movie of a TV show or movie and just kind of analyze it, mm. like front to back. Um, for all this, for all the rest of the month in March, uh, his co-host Dwight is taking a little hiatus. So I will be uh, the guest host for a couple episodes. Yeah, uh, we're reviewing, excellent. We're reviewing episodes of uh, Bob's Burgers, the IT Crowd, and an episode of Oz. Funnily enough, <laughs> yeah, I think he's having me on at one at some point too. Yeah, uh, I, I got to double check And not, check not to that. give anything away, but you might just see him on a future episode of Jukebox Zeros down the line. Well, by that, I think he's actually coming on next month. Oh, don't spoil it. <laughs> oh, we can't dun, give it away. Dun, dun. I I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. Nobody's listening. Oh boy. And boy. I don't I don't know the guy, so I'm not going to be on that podcast. <laughs> That's fine. What's the uh, name of that again? Writer's Bagel Writer's Basket. Writer's Bagel Basket. Writer's Bagel Basket. Writer's I I will have to. Writer's right. Bagel Basket. Writer's Bagel Basket. <laughs> Oh, All right, uh, now three part harmony. Writer, writer baby, baby basket. Baby. <laughs> I just writer's baby basket. <laughs> oh, oh baby, boy. oh baby. <laughs> uh, we have fun. Yeah. Uh, that about does it for this episode of Jukebox Zeros. Our theme song is Sunny Day by the band Froggy and the Friendship. Uh, you can check them out at froggyandthefriendship.bandcamp.com. Uh, if you've got an album you'd like to suggest for us to review or just want to leave us some feedback or a comment, uh, you can email us at jukeboxzeros at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash jukebox zeros podcast or on Twitter at twitter.com slash jukebox zeros. Uh, you can find us, uh, rate us, and review us, and subscribe to us on Apple Podcast and now on Stitcher. And our archive main page is jukeboxzeros.podbean.com. That about does it for this episode. I'm Lee. I'm Patrick. And remember the diapers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, go- I'm going back in the corner now. <laughs> <We're gonna- laughs>